Hi everyone and welcome to my channel and to this video where I'm going to share with you some of my favourite methods for framing your pastel artwork. It's so important to finish your work off with a good frame and protect it for life. So in this video I'm going to talk you through some of my favourite methods of framing and discuss the pros and cons of each one. Because I don't have much framed work in my own studio, I've been waiting for an opportunity to visit my parents' house where they have lots of my framed work and also to take a little trip to my favourite framer in the whole world, which I'll do later on in the video. I hope that you enjoy this and that you find it helpful. If you do, then please do subscribe to me here on YouTube. Also consider checking me out on Patreon where you'll get access to all of my full length tutorials and lots more pastel help. I'm at my parents house at the moment and they have lots of framed examples of my work that I have gifted them over the years. So I'm going to use some of those pieces just to chat about a few different methods that I like to use when framing my work. So this first piece, and you can see two of the models here with me. This one actually has a glass in it that I'm not so keen on and when it's hanging in my parents' house it always annoys me because there's a lot of reflection off the glass. So today, when I visit my framer later on, I'm going to get him to discuss different types of glass that you can use and we're going to swap this one out for a better glass so I can show you the direct comparison. When I first started out creating wildlife and pet portraits in soft pastel, I actually started doing some of my own framing work and from that experience alone it really made me appreciate the hard work involved in making a frame. I also realised as soon as I started dealing with professional galleries that they expect a certain level of framing to uh, fit in with the rest of the work in the gallery. So I very quickly realised that my own framing was not going to cut it. And as soon as I started dealing with professional framers, I quickly realised that this costs money. The thing is, if you're trying to create a professional look to your work, and you've perhaps spent many hours creating a very professional and quality piece of work, the last thing you really want to do in the end is stick a cheap frame on it and devalue the whole work. So my biggest piece of advice that you'll get from this video is to set aside a decent budget for your framing because quality framing does cost money. A lot of the time when I create pet portraits, I send them to my clients unframed and I guide them if they need some help in choosing framing, but mostly it's up to my clients to choose the frame in the end. Whereas if I'm creating work that's for a gallery or some of my wildlife and landscape work, I tend to choose the framing on those pieces. And I always found that when exhibiting or trying to sell my work in galleries, the better the frame, the better my chances of selling the work. So before I head off to visit my framer, Let's show you a few more examples from this house of the different types of framing that I love to use. So the first method that I'll talk about is probably my favourite method to frame a pastel. And if you're a fan of Unison Pastels, you might recognise this little painting from my selection of animal colours. But I framed this little piece without using a mount or a mat or a passepartout as it's known in many different countries. This is framed with a wooden outer frame and then we have a wooden inner slip instead of using mount board. Then as you can see the glass is actually in between the two wooden mouldings. The little piece itself sits right in at the back on this one and there's a little channel just at the bottom should it get a rough knock and any of the pastel dust gets dislodged from the painting. So one thing that you want to try and create always with a pastel frame is a little channel where any excess dust should it fall off 
can fall into and not ruin the look of your frame. I use this method a lot when I'm framing my work as I love the simple look of it and how using the double layer of wood can really increase the overall size of the work too. And on this one, I've actually used some of that special glass that I'm gonna discuss with my framer later on. So I'm in a room here that has a lot of windows in it and I'm just turning it around a little bit because it really does cut down the reflection and the glare that you get a lot of the time on the glass. But I'll talk more about this special glass when I get to my framers. So just to show you another couple of examples like that, because this is the main frame type that I actually have here at my mum and dad's house. And it really is probably my favourite method to use because of the end look of it and also because, as I'll explain later when I show you some of the frames that have a, a mount or a mat, it's much easier to keep this clean as sometimes pastel dust can fall off and dirty your mount or your mat. So in this method that just can't happen as easily because there is no inner card um, mount that can get dirtied. It's much easier to handle these pieces I find. So this is another example of the same method of framing. This time we've got a cream outer frame and a much more narrow inner slip. But it's still the same idea, you've got wood on the outside, then your layer of glass, then that inner slip made from wood as well. And between it and the actual pastel painting, there's this little channel where any loose dust can fall. And also this one is just framed with regular glass, so you may see a little bit of reflection off that. But on the smaller pieces, and especially pieces with lighter colours, it's really not so bad. So if your budget doesn't stretch to the special glass, it's quite alright to frame it with just regular framing glass too. So here is a slightly larger piece, a very unusual subject matter for me. My dad is a rally driver, so this was done specially for him. And my framer, who is a bit of a genius, suggested adding this little red stripe around the inside of the frame, which I think works really beautifully. And that is the beauty of working with a framer who really knows what he's doing and has a wonderful eye for this as they really help you finish off your work and present it beautifully. So again, this is the same method. We've got the wooden outer frame, which is white this time. And we've got the wooden inner slip, which is behind the glass. And he simply added an extra slip into this one, which is a narrow little slither of red, which runs right around it. But it's the same method as I've just shown you with the other two, wood, then glass, then wood, and then that little channel where any excess dust can fall. So definitely my favourite method of framing a pastel, but let's show you the other two that I also like to use. So the next method I'll show you is another method that I really love, and quite often a lot of my clients favour this method too as it tends to increase the overall size of the piece in the frame. This one is using the classic or traditional mount. If you're in the UK, it's called a mount. The Americans tend to call it a mat. And if you're elsewhere in Europe, you might hear it referred to as a passepartout. But whatever you call it, it's made from mount board and you can either use a, a single or a double, or even in this case, I've used a triple mount. So we've got the wooden molding on the outside. You've got the layer of glass. Then next to that, you've got perhaps your double mount and leaving ideally a little channel in between some of the mounts to allow any excess pastel dust to fall into that little channel. And as I said, this method works really nicely and a lot of my clients opt for this. The only thing that I will say against using the mount is that sometimes when a little bit of pastel dust falls and it doesn't fall into that channel, 
it can dirty your mount, which if it gets bad enough, perhaps you need to get a fresh mount made for the frame. So the other method I find keeps the work looking cleaner, even when it gets a bit of a sharp knock. But this one definitely looks very attractive. And this is another example of that. The previous one I used a, a dark outer moulding and this one I've gone for all white which I think looks really fresh and modern. But it's the same idea, you've got your wooden moulding on the outside, your layer of glass and then inside that your um, double mount in this case with a little channel of space between it and the actual painting. So whether it's a mount or a mat or a pass part two, this is a lovely method for framing your pastel work. So the final method that I want to show you is the method that I use to frame a lot of my really big work. And this method is a little bit controversial as I know that a lot of artists don't like to use this method. But I've used it over many years and I haven't had any problems yet. So in this method, the glass is actually touching the pastel painting. So it's the, the molding, the wooden frame, then the glass, and then the painting directly underneath. So I'll try and give you some close-ups of that. And I'll also show you a few other pieces that I've used this method with. And it's simply because when working on velour paper and working on a very large piece, sometimes I am a bit worried that some pastel dust will get dislodged over time or if the piece receives a hard knock and I've literally had one of these big paintings fall off of the wall in a gallery and fell face down on the floor and when I picked it up not one bit of pastel dust had moved simply because the glass is creating a little bit of a squish and sort of sandwiching the piece in there. So it is a little bit of a controversial method because as some artists would argue, if any mold or any moisture gets onto your painting or onto the glass on the inside, then it's going to be directly touching your painting, which is a problem. So perhaps if you live in a particularly humid or damp place, maybe this would cause some problems, but I'm from Ireland and I now live in a very humid place as well and so far I haven't had any problems with this and we do have a lot of humidity. So here are just a couple more examples of my larger work framed like this tied up against the glass and some of my paintings are as big as 40 inches wide and for those paintings I find this method works really nicely. And this is another example that I have to show you just lastly of where I have framed the piece directly underneath the glass. Another larger painting where I thought this was the best option. And this has been uh, knocking around for many years now and there's not one bit of pastel dust that has moved. It's still as perfect as it was the day I put it in the frame. So yeah, this is a more controversial method, but it has worked for me in the past and continues to work for me where my larger work is concerned. Those would be the three most popular framing methods that I know of and that I've seen other pastel artists use. If you have some different ideas on framing, then please do leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and what your favourite framing methods are. So here I am at my favourite framers in the whole world. Uh, so let's go inside and meet John the master framer and see if he has managed to change the glass on that frame that I showed you earlier. So let's go inside. Hello. There we go, Emma. That's you now. That is brilliant. So this is it swapped from... What was that glass that was on it the first time? Standard non-reflecting glass. Very Standard. popular during the 70s and 80s. But St technology has now progressed quite a bit and this sort of thing can be produced 
which is a lot less reflection. And this is the sort of glass that you would find used in the in the museums and the galleries. So yes, it's quite expensive, but for an extra special piece, or sometimes what I find pieces that are quite dark in colour, this is really a good job. Well, well thank you very much, John. That is welcome. great. And that just proves the benefit of coming to a professional framer. It's always money well spent. I'll see you in another See you soon. <laughs> so I hope that you can see from the footage here just what a difference this has made. The image is so much clearer. You can really see the richness of the colours and the detail in the painting. And no matter where you hang it and where you are in the room, there's very minimal reflection coming off this. So the old glass beside the new glass, such a difference. It's expensive glass. But for a very special piece or a very special client, it's certainly worth it. So what is a picture frame going to cost? Well, to give you a rough idea, and this is only from the perspective of the UK, you might expect to pay anywhere between 40 and 60 pounds for a small frame, up to 150 to 200 pounds for a very large frame. Of course, all the decisions that you make about the frame, whether it has a single or a double mount, whether it has normal glass or special non-reflective glass, all of those decisions are going to affect the cost. And I'm sure that this cost will differ depending on what country you're from as well. I've had to make this video in many different sections and Due to current COVID restrictions, I wasn't allowed to take you upstairs in my framers workshop. So I decided that when I would get back to my own studio, that I would open up some frames and show you inside and give you some extra tips on what things to think of when you're actually creating your artwork. And I also want to talk to you now about ready-made frames and framing on a budget because of course it's not always possible to spend big money on framing especially when you're just starting out so i want to give you some tips in this section on how to present your work professionally but on a budget if you're planning to buy a frame off the shelf or straight from a shop the first thing you need to consider is the size that you make your artwork so before you start painting, you need to be sure that the aspect ratio and the size of your work is actually going to fit one of these ready-made frames. Now that to me in itself is a problem because I love to work in all sorts of different aspect ratios. And for that, I'm always having to get custom made frames. But if you're willing to work in set sizes, then you'll find it easy to find a frame to fit your work. Next, you wanna consider leaving a little border of um, clean paper or whatever your surface is around the edge of your artwork. This makes it easier for handling the artwork so I'm never having to touch the pastel area but it also means that when I put the mount or the mat on top of this it's got a little edge um, to cover and it can come cleanly up to the edge of the painting. So I create this little edge just when I tape my pastel paper onto my easel and I normally leave uh, anywhere between just under a centimeter or just under half an inch to about an inch or so. So I do that on every single piece. All of my paintings you'll notice have this little border here which is both for handling and for framing. Now regarding the colour of the mount or the mat that you choose, that's really personal preference I think. Some people love coloured mats. Um, me personally, I think I tend to go cream and white most of the time. The whole idea when I'm framing a piece of work is usually to try and sell it. So I usually try to keep it neutral, something that won't put buyers off, something that lets the artwork um, colours sing out without being distracted by other colours around it. Um, and for example with this one, I've got a triple mount here and it's mostly white but I did manage to bring a little bit of colour into the mounts just by 
one of the, the mounts inside being a different colour so you can add a little um, border of colour using your mounts. But personally, I tend to keep my mount choices quite neutral and it's mostly to try and attract the biggest number of buyers. But you've also got to judge it painting by painting because I've seen many paintings which have really suited a coloured mount or a black mount. So there's no rule that fits all here. This is really personal preference and what the individual painting will suit. I've actually taken apart this little frame so that I can show you exactly what goes on inside. This is the, um, the triple mount and my artwork all sandwiched together as one piece and then that can just simply go into the frame and sealed up at the back. So I wanted to show you how this part actually gets made. So if you can see around the edge we've got our double mount which are stuck together but then we've actually got space that runs in between that mount and the third mount which is actually tight to the painting. And the space in here is usually created by uh, some foam board, some foam core. So um, this stuff, which this is a five millimeter thick one, you can get it in different thicknesses. So this would be cut and put in as a, a section in between the mounts to create that little gap. So it's usually foam board, I believe, that most framers would use to do that. And ideally you want to use all archival materials so that nothing that's going to touch your painting is going to affect it over the years. Framers tend to use specially made tapes for sealing everything up at the back. Um, this one is a little bit of a mess at the moment because I've actually um, taken this one out in the past and uh, put it back in myself. So this wasn't professional framing tape but it's doing the job for me with this little piece at the moment. But you do want to make sure that you use good quality uh, framing tapes for this. Both um, archival and incredibly sticky, they won't come off over time. That is the whole section then that would go in my frame. And obviously with the additional foam board section in there, it makes it a little bit thicker. So ideally you want to look for frames perhaps with a, a deeper rebate, this, this depth of the moulding where you slide your artwork into. So sometimes you may need to go for a moulding that is deeper to accommodate the thick sandwich that you're trying to frame. And then it's just a matter of putting your piece in. There's usually a backing board that goes over that and then the whole thing gets taped up. If you're working with ready-made frames, one thing you could do is change the mount in it or add a double or a triple mount to make it more suitable for pastel work. So what I wanted to quickly show you now is how I at home can freshen up a mount or cut myself a new mount. I've got a very basic old school mount cutter. Now the mounts that I can cut on this bit of kit are decent enough. They're not bad quality. It takes a little bit of practice, but they're not as accurate or as perfect as the machine or computer cut mounts that a lot of framers use these days. So I have this really for framing the odd little print um, or smaller pieces of work. I wouldn't normally cut my own mounts for my bigger professional paintings. But I thought today I would show you very quickly how I would cut a little mount for this piece. The main bit of the kit is this base with the long ruler. We've got lots of measurements along here so that you can make uh, your mount different depths and then the actual cutting tool itself because a mount actually has a, a little beveled edge so the edge inside the window of the mount is usually at a 45 degree angle and that's what this little tool here is that's for cutting that um, opening and leaving the little edge which has a 45 degree angle which is always nice so to start with, I've cut my piece of mount board to exactly two inches bigger than the dimensions of my actual painting. So not the dimensions of the full sheet, 
the dimensions of the actual painting inside. And I've decided that I want to make a two inch border on that. So I've cut this, uh, well, four inches bigger, two inches bigger on each side. And then I want to mark out my opening that I need to cut on the back. So I put the mount board in face down. I've chosen the two inch option on my ruler settings. Then it's just a matter of marking in and cutting out the mount. And there we have our mount cut and hopefully it should neatly fit the painting. So now that you've got your mount to fit your piece, I would then use some of that professional framing tape to secure the piece and the mount together. Then you may have other mounts to cut, um, a spacer to cut if you're going to leave a gap. It's a lot of work. It actually takes an awful lot of time just to cut one or two mounts. So once you start doing this, you start to realize why framers charge, what they charge. It's very labor intensive. So for me, using a professional framer frees up a lot of my time because this stuff is time consuming. It also means that I can work to whatever dimensions I want as the frame will be custom made to fit it. And I just love having a second set of eyes to help me finish off my work professionally. Someone who knows the full range of frames available and can really hand pick something to suit my work perfectly. But if you're working on more of a budget and you're going to be going for ready-made frames, I hope that at least some of the tips in this video will help you make your work look that little bit more professional. If you have found this video helpful, then please do subscribe to me here on YouTube. Don't forget to click the little bell notification button as well so that you hear when I make a new video. And consider checking me out on my Patreon channel if you'd like to learn even more. You can now check out my entire tutorial library over on my website emmacolbertart.com but I'll add all of these links in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and until next time, happy pastling.